Welcome to GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative sustainable gardening program. I'm your host, Meg West, and it is a beautiful spring day. Lucky me, I get to spend the day puttering in the garden. What to do? Well, we're gonna give you some ideas about springtime garden projects, like checking your irrigation system, composting, and taking care of fruit trees. We're gonna help you get your garden ready for the springtime and summer growing season. First up, Kathy Pere from the City Water Resources Department will show you how to do a springtime irrigation checkup. Hi, I'm Kathy, and today we're gonna to visit two properties. We're gonna do a spring evaluation of our irrigation systems before our summer watering. Let's go take a look. Well, let's turn the system on here real quick. That's important to do during the daylight so you can see where their sprinklers are going. This is a manual system. What we're gonna do is turn it on for a minute and then we're gonna flag any areas that we see need to be repaired or adjusted. Turn this on ever so gently. What you can see is that this sprinkler is below the surface here. So I probably bring that one up a little bit, but the most important thing at this point is you can see the sprinklers are spraying out onto the driveway. So I'm gonna flag that one and check the, uh, the throw on what that sprinkler head is. And if you look in the corner, we also have another one that's spraying out there on the sidewalk. If you also notice, we've got a sprinkler head that's not even spraying. So it's either blocked or there's a break. Something's happening, but there's no water coming out of it. Making the adjustments and getting rid of this overthrow of water onto the sidewalks is as easy as changing the nozzle. What you do, you just pull that riser up, unscrew the old nozzle that's throwing out onto the sidewalk. Take this new one that's only gonna throw 90 degrees so that it's good on this corner. Screw it in the top. Make sure it's pointing at the grass, and that's it. Well, this is the other sprinkler that uh, didn't have any water coming out of it. So the first thing we're gonna check is just to see if maybe that filter is just blocked and dirty. It could be something as simple as that. If you take the nozzle off, you're gonna pull this filter out. Aha, it's got some blockage on that filter. That could be part of the problem, why the water wasn't coming out of this. So we're gonna clean it up, put it back together, and then uh, we'll do a final inspection, turn the water back on, see if that helped. All right, we're gonna turn the sprinklers back on here and see how our repairs did. All right, well, if we look at this now, the water is staying on the grass. It's throwing in a 90 degree angle, perfect. Well, this sprinkler over here that we cleaned the filter on, it's not going off. It's still gurgling out the head and we're not getting a spray. So there's a couple of different options. What I would advise is to dig that spray head out, just unscrew it from the riser and see if there's some debris that was actually in the sprinkler line and just wash it out, clean it, put it back on and see if it works. The other option is that there's too many spray heads on this line and it's the very end sprinkler and there's just not enough water to make it spray. So that gives you a couple of different things to think about. You can change the nozzles and put low precipitation rate nozzles on and then you'll have more pressure in the whole system and solve that problem without having to put a new valve in. All right, let's turn this other one on, see if we see any issues. Ah, there we go. All right, let's flag this. We've got a broken pipe under here. You can see the water flowing out at a strong stream, so we better shut this one off. Got a lot of water wasted with that. Unfortunately, there's a plant on top of it. So what we're gonna need to do is gonna have to pull this plant up and out, expose the pipe underneath, and then do some PVC repair. So what I'm gonna show you here is just a quick example of how you can reattach uh, pieces of PVC pipe using a connector. You do have to have it exposed. It needs to be dry. And you'll need to use two parts to this. This is a connector. This is a regular piece of PVC. This is called a primer. The primer goes on both surfaces of the PVC and then it'll dry, just takes a moment or so. And then what you're gonna do is put just a little bit of nice smooth layer of glue or PVC cement. I'm gonna try and keep this off your fingers if you can. You'll have blue fingers. You put it on the pipe itself, a nice layer around here, nice and smooth. You put a layer of it inside of the connector. And then the trick, is when you put these together, you slide them together 
and give them a quarter of a turn and hold it for 30 seconds. You don't want to turn the water, pressurized water back on for probably 12 to 24 hours. You got to make sure the glue is set. So don't bury your pipe and your repair until you've made sure that you don't have any leaks. I'm finished checking my irrigation system, so I'm sure that I'm not wasting any water this summer. Kathy will be back later in the show to give us a few more tips about the spring irrigation checkup, including how to adjust your irrigation controller and how to fix damaged drip lines. What's my next project? Composting this avocado tree. This is the compost that I made myself, and I'll show you how. So there are two types of compost ingredients that you want for good compost. One is wet greens and the other is dry browns. So I have some examples of wet greens right here. One is kitchen scraps. This is a week's worth of snacks and coffee from my office at Arcadia Studio. So I save that at the end of the week and bring it home with me. The another good wet green would be lawn clippings or any sort of uh, wet green material you get from the garden. So that's one layer. Another layer is the dry browns, and that's what we have over here. So sticks uh, that are chopped up if possible, straw, dry leaves, paper, or shredded egg cartons are all good things to use in a dry brown. Next, we're gonna show you how to layer these two elements and make a really nice compost. So the dry browns do require a little bit of prep and that shredding and chopping before they go into your compost layering system. So what I do is I collect any grass clippings, dry grass clippings or prunings from trees, things like that. I shred it and I chop it and leave it here so it's ready to go into the main compost pile when I'm doing that layering. So the key to good compost is a layering system. You start with your wet greens. Now remember, those are the nitrogen rich parts of your compost. Got our kitchen scraps, put those in. First layer. Mm. Other wet greens you can use are lawn clippings. So put those in next. That's our nitrogen rich layer. We're going to spread it out. Good. And since this is a, look, it's a dry brown. Yeah, there we go. Put it right in. Next layer is the dry browns. We're going to cover the top. We got some shredded newspaper, egg cartons, and dry banana leaves. So you got your dry browns on top. Those are your carbon rich elements of your compost. So together, these are gonna mix up, get the biological activity going and produce good compost in anywhere from 30 days to four or five months. After the layering, you wanna wet it down, not so it's sopping wet, but just so it's kind of spongy. Here are a few things you should never put in your compost. Cheese, meats, anything really oily or cooked food that will attract raccoons or rats to your compost. So the last step to making compost is optional. I don't do this step because I'm too lazy, but if you want your compost to go faster, if you want it to be ready in 30 days or less, then you're gonna have to stir it to get air in there. So take a shovel, you can stir it around, mix up the browns and the greens, especially layers that have been sitting for a while so you can add some air in there. You can also turn the entire pile and this compost maker is actually designed to do that. It's got these stackable layers. You can just take them off one by one, set it next to the compost pile and shovel it in and turn the entire compost pile. And again, that will make it go faster. So depending on how old your compost is, there may still be little chunks of wood or different recognizable items in here that you don't necessarily want to put on the ground around your fruit trees or whatever plants you're composting. So then you need to sift the compost. And next I'm going to show you how to sift the compost with a homemade compost sifter. Here's my handy dandy homemade compost sifter. It's made out of two bicycle tire rims and with some welded wire mesh around the inside. And there's some little wheels here that sit right on these rims so that once you put the compost in, you can just turn it around, look at that. And the compost falls right through to the wheelbarrow. 
and we sieve out all the chunkies. Ah, here it is, the finished compost. I took the big chunks and put them back into the compost pile, and this is ready to get spread onto your plants. A two inch layer usually works about just around the outside of the drip line of the plant. What I'm gonna do is take this compost and spread it around the base of this apple tree. What could be more sustainable than taking something that used to be kitchen waste and yard scraps and turning it into food through composting? Another way to keep plants healthy is compost tea. Next, we'll speak with Mark Broomfield of Santa Barbara City College to get the inside scoop on his own special brew. I'm here with Mark from Santa Barbara City College. He was kind enough to bring some compost tea. We're going to show you how that's used later on. But first, I wanted to find out a little bit more about the compost tea. So how'd you brew it? Uh, well, compost tea is two main ingredients. It's compost. Uh, water and then it's forced air. Okay. So I take uh, compost that we've been working on for about three years at City College. Um, and the reason we take old compost is because the longer the compost is allowed to sit, the higher the fungal co content that it has. I then take that compost and uh, mix it with mycorrhizae and fish emulsion and uh, seaweed. Mix that up and let it uh, bloom for three days uh, to the open air. And once it starts to get white and fuzzy, looks like fungus, I put that in a bag and put it in a tea brewer. Mm -hmm. And that tea brewer has a, basically a jet engine that forces air into 80 gallons of water with uh, about five pounds of compost. And after three days, the tea is entirely activated. And as we can see in the microscope, we can actually see some fungal colonies living in there, which appear as long strands with little side shoots coming out of them. And those are the new mycorrhizal hyphae that are gonna expand and grow. And the great thing about fungus is once you have one of them, they'll keep reproducing themselves. And the reason this is so key is because we know we have a guaranteed aerobic fungus in here. So I know I'm not introducing anything bad to the environment. I'm adding something that's gonna be beneficial. So over at City College, how do you use the compost tea? Uh, our compost tea is our primary method of all plant maintenance. Mm -hmm. So we try to take a holistic approach to mm -hmm. the care of our plants. Um, and compost tea pretty much epitomizes that because it allows us to fertilize, control pests, um, improve cell structure of plants, um, improve wa water retention in the soil. Um, it really uh, is kind of the magic bullet for our garden. It is the magic garden. bullet. Anyone uh, who uses it is just totally amazed by how much better their plants do as oh, soon as they start. In, in fact, you can tell a noticeable difference in the size of the stem of the plant, the leaf of the yeah. plant. The flowers are bigger, last longer, and really there's very little fertilizer or anything in it. It's just what comes from your compost. And the great thing is the compost is just as good when you're done making the tea as before you made the tea. Amazing. You can use that right back out. So. Nice. So how do you actually apply it? Do you do it in the soil or? We have, a, we, we use both methods. Uh -huh. we, we both soil drench it, just emptying out five gallon buckets into the ground, especially around uh, tropical plants, bananas, mm -hmm. palm trees, things like that. Give them a soil drench. And then we also foliar feed um, all three acres at wow. least once a month. Next, we headed to SBCC to learn how to make our own compost tea at home. So, uh, this is actually a little advanced setup for probably your home use, but you can do something just as simple with a five gallon bucket, just like this, um, an aquarium pump from the store. And basically, instead of five pounds of compost, you only need about a handful of compost that you can put into an old dress sock, tie it up, or put it in some cheesecloth wrapped up. Um, and just basically let that sit in your bucket and put the aquarium pump in there. You could add a little mycorrhizae, it's always recommended, especially for your home. Your compost pile is probably not gonna be very high in fungal count. Um, and then soluble seaweed is probably the other thing that you definitely need. Um, the other things are all food sources for your fungi. So you can choose anything you want from molasses, I've seen people do it with honey, um, fish emulsion, fish hydrosylate. Um, really, there's a lot of choices out there for you. The Lifescape Garden at Santa Barbara City College is open to the public every day from dawn to dusk.
I'm done composting my avocado tree, and while I was at it, I noticed that this tree has a little bit of frost damage from the winter time, and this is a good time to prune that off. This twig right here has been damaged, and you can tell because it's not producing any nice spurts of new leaves and new growth. So I'm going to go ahead and prune this off right at the base. Now, it's important to do some research before you prune the fruit trees in your yard, so you can consult with a qualified arborist or pick up a good book on pruning. One of my favorites is Rosalind Creasy's Edible Garden Book. This has a wealth of information about all types of edible plants, but don't take my word for it. Check out all the beautiful fruit trees in my garden. As you can see, there are a variety of fruit trees that grow well in Santa Barbara County. We live in one of the best fruit tree growing climates in the country. A group of students in Santa Barbara recognized this and saw an opportunity to help those in need by transforming unused land into a food forest. Well, Mesa Harmony Garden is, it looks like an orchard, but what we're actually building is a food forest. and. We're growing food to be sent to the food bank to uh, give fresh fruit and nuts to um, people in need of better food. A group of uh, students at Santa Barbara City College were um, in a class that Professor Adam Green taught, and they had to do a sustainability project. And uh, he sent them off to find me, and they had talked to the church already about doing something with this land, which was sitting empty. And we all got, got together, had a meeting, and the church was, Father Ludo, who's the uh, priest here, was really enthusiastic about the concept. And we came to an agreement that we would do a food forest here and grow food for the food bank. And that no sooner happened than my wife and I were taking a walk and we ran into a person who worked at the food bank that did their backyard harvest program. And he said, gee, we have a bunch of fruit trees uh, we could put in. We've been given a donation of money to put in fruit trees, and we said, perfect. And it all just came together. It's really easy in Santa Barbara. There's so much that grows here. I just looked for easy to grow trees that would do well in the Mesa that were really abundant. So we picked a lot of stone fruit, some apples, pears, just all kinds of things. We have volunteer days where people can come and help us. So we have volunteers that work here. Um, we put in a series of berms and swales, and we're doing a lot of rainwater harvesting so that we don't have to use water you know, out of the faucet that we're keeping these trees well hydrated without it. We've done a huge amount of mulching. We put in cover crops to get nitrogen in the soil and carbon and all sorts of things like that. And then we do a little judicious pruning. But the nice thing about a food system like this is it's a lot less work than annual. So as these trees get established, they don't need much. Do you have a fruit tree in your backyard that needs to be harvested? Santa Barbara has a backyard harvesting program where someone will come to your house, harvest your fruit trees, and then give the fruit to someone in need. Visit backyardharvest.org for more information. Or do you have an empty space in your yard that needs a fruit tree? Up next, Margie Grace from Grace Design Associates will tell you about her favorite fruit tree, the apricot. What tree is that? What tree is that? Here's an apricot tree. It's one of my favorites. It gives us shade and it gives us fruit. And it's like a harbinger of spring because it's a, it blooms early in the year. When you see the apricot trees blooming, you say, all right, it's about to warm up. And then you get the lovely snow petals on the ground. It originates in China, but it really got going in the Middle East. Armenia was really big and then in India as well. It is deciduous. Uh, it's in leaf right now and it has some fruit just coming on. Um, it is a smallish tree, stays about 20 feet high. It can go higher if you prune it differently so that it's taller rather than wide. But in that way, it's really well suited for a city lot. 
If you definitely want full sun, you want decent drainage, although it's pretty tolerant of uh, different soils. Um, we've got pretty low chill hours here in Santa Barbara. We kind of top out at about 350 if you're in the city. Um, there are some low chill uh, varieties that do 300 hours of chill, and then after that you're kind of 500 hours. So if you're climbing up into the foothills a little bit, you can use those other trees. You're going to want to be looking for something like sun-kissed variety or autumn gold uh, in our low chill varieties. And they will always be grafted fruit bearing wood on top of rootstock and then you can grab either a standard size tree that'll grow in that 20 foot range or you can have it on dwarfing rootstock and keep it sort of smaller. You could even grow it in a pot. The apricot tree, it's, it really has really beautiful foliage. You see a little bit of this bronzy at the new growth and this nice red on the new uh, sprigs. Altogether, it's really quite ornamental. Uh, we're starting to set fruit here. You can see the bloom just coming off and the fruit pushing it. Um, these are going to be ripe in about, mm, going to take about three, four months more. Uh, they'll be ready in late spring, early summer. This one's an early bloomer. Most apricots for our area are self-fertile, so you don't need to get another type to cross-pollinate it to get fruit. And these are unusual of the dormant fruit trees. These are actually pruned uh, after the fruit, they're pruned in, in summer. Uh, and it's really to avoid uh, fungal growth coming in through the pruning wounds and, and damaging the tree. You'll get great big pieces of dyed back growth if you have pruned it when it's dormant and you happen to have warm winters like we do and you have rain, you'll have fungal problems. So um, very unusual for a stone fruit to prune when not dormant. Um, some areas you'll find pests sucking insects um, and you can do dormant sprays for those. These are organic treatments. It's really just um, horticultural oil and it suffocates bugs. Um, at my house, you know, about uh, two miles from here, we find that we don't spray at all. We just, we don't need it. So um, also my kind of tree, low fuss, low muss, not worried about really most anything. Um, fruiting spurs come on the new wood. Uh, about four years worth of good growth on it. It's a light pruning that you need to do. I use the whips that come off of it. I let them dry a little bit and then I use those in the garden for stakes and whatnot. This is a young tree. It's only been in the ground for about two years and we bought it as a 15 gallon uh, plant already growing. Um, mostly now we're pruning for a little bit of structure. We're going to lift it a little so it has a higher head and it'll make some shade and, and uh, give some privacy for the house as well. We're lucky it's already in, in fruit, it's already in leaf, it's a little early for the rest of the trees in town, but this one turns out to be a really good one. And uh, I'm thinking this year will be the year they get some not only fruit to eat, but a little bit of jam off of this tree too. Here's something else I wanted to show you. I planted this apricot tree close to a downspout so that during the winter rains, the water soaks into the plant's roots. I use lots of mulch and compost around the base so that it locks in the water and the tree needs much less supplemental water during the summertime. Here's another idea for a wonderful fruit that you can easily grow in your garden, the pineapple guava. It's the star of this episode's Plant Rant. <laughs> On each episode of GardenWise, we'll pick one of the 300,000 flowering plant species on Earth and help you get to know it better. Today, you'll get the scoop on pineapple guava, a lovely low-maintenance shrub with exotic flowers and juicy pink and green fruit. Pineapple guavas are champions in three major categories, foliage, flowers, and fruit. The foliage, the plant has really pretty gray evergreen leaves. The flowers, the plant explodes with edible, showy red and cream blossoms in May. The fruit, the plant bears medium size greenish fruit in the fall. The flavor is reminiscent of pineapple. The fresh pulp with the seeds can be eaten raw or cooked in puddings, pastry fillings, fritters, dumplings, fruit sponge cake, pies, or tarts, and used as flavoring for ice cream. 
Mmm. Preserved fruit makes lovely chutneys, jams, jellies, and relish. Believe me, pineapple guavas are good eaten. Pineapple guava is also known as feoa for its Latin name, feoa celuiana. It's native to southern Brazil, northern Argentina, and western Paraguay and Uruguay, where it grows wild in the mountains. Plant pineapple guavas in areas that offer full sun to partial shade and make sure the soil is well drained. Water your guava weekly until it's established and only occasionally thereafter. Our natural rainfall typically offers sufficient moisture for these drought tolerant plants, except in hot summer areas where occasional supplemental watering is required in the summertime. Landscape designers plant pineapple guavas as multi-branching shrubs or small accent trees. Remember, these plants produce fruit and leaf litter, so avoid planting them directly over hardscape or deck areas. You can also grow pineapple guavas side by side to create an informal evergreen hedge. This planted screen can be used to block wind or to create privacy. With a dense habit and height and spread of 8 to 15 feet, these pest and disease resistant evergreens are overachievers in gardens throughout Santa Barbara County. The pineapple guava gets a garden wise award of excellence for producing such exotic flowers and fruit with very little water and maintenance. So are you dying to plant some edibles to enjoy the summer? Here's a fava bean, and I actually planted this during the winter time. It's a nitrogen fixing plant, so it actually takes the nitrogen from the air and fixes it in the ground, so it's available for summertime heavy feeders like tomatoes. But before you start planting, here's Kathy Pere with a few more things to look for when checking your irrigation system this spring. All right, we're at our second property, and it's got an automatic controller here. So before they turn it on for the summer, we gotta make sure there's a few things that we check. It's been on rain off. We're gonna run it automatically and check each of the zones and use our flags to mark anything that might be leaking. One of the important things to check on the controller is the backup battery. Each controller has a, a backup battery, usually tucked away in a little cubby. This one uses a nine volt. I change these every year. It's if your battery doesn't have enough charge and the power goes out, there's a good chance your clock will go on to default. It'll water 10 minutes every day, every station. You can see your water bill double. This battery is March 2011. Definitely wasn't changed last year, so we're gonna change that this year so that we're current, just in case we get any of those power surges. One of the other things to look at when you're turning this on for the summer is that you wanna use the seasonal adjust or the water budget percent so that you can start watering as the plants need it, in April, maybe only 70%, in May up to 80, by midsummer, you're gonna be watering 100% of all the plants' water needs. As we get into the fall, you're gonna turn it back down. You can use the weekly watering index on waterwisesb.org. It's important to be sure with your drip line that you flush all the debris that might be in the, in the pipes out before your summer watering season. Find the end of your pipe, the part with the figure eight on it, open that up, open the pipe and then let it run for one to two minutes. All right, we're gonna turn the water on here. Take a look at this drip line and see if we see any geysers or uh, broken emitters or cut pipes. Aha, uh -huh. we got a geyser here. We gotta make sure we flag that because when we turn the water off, we're not gonna know where on that drip pipe the leak is. So let's take a peek, see if we find anything else. All right, you can see here, we've definitely got a hole in the drip tubing. All right, let's flag it. We'll come back and repair it when the water's off. All right, now that the water's off, we've got our flag here so we know where the problem is. We've got our little first aid kit. In that, it's got some extra emitters. It's got some goof plugs to fix holes and a connector, all the tools we might need. So let's pull this out, pull the mulch away, see what we've got here. We have an emitter here and it looks like it just lost its top. So in my first aid kit, I always have a few extra parts this particular one just needs a little flag. So we're gonna put that back in here, and there we go. That flag emitter is fixed. It's now gonna drip just one gallon per hour. For this repair, we're gonna use a goof plug. There's a hole here, and there's no plant, so we don't need any watering. So what we do, these little guys, this is a goof plug. 
you're going to put the small end into the hole that's in that tubing that's watering where there's no plants. I like to hold on to it with a little pliers, makes it a little easier for me. Take it, push it into the tubing, and there you go, it's fixed. Let's turn the water on and check our repair, make sure it doesn't leak. Our repair is good, there's no water. Just give a quick example of what happens when you get a shovel cut in your drip line, roots from plants will actually grow into your drip line and block the water flow. So instead of climbing up on the slope here and show you how to repair, we're just gonna take two pieces of drip pipe as if we'd cut it with our shovel and then we're gonna reconnect it together. You need a simple connector and a little bit of elbow grease. You'll feel it catch and there you go, it's attached. It needs to connect to the other end so that you'll have a full tube, same thing, using your connector and the empty piece of a pipe. Slowly kind of get it in. There's a little bit of a barb in there, so you have to work it back and forth. Connected. That's all there is to it. You can repair that yourself. Adjusting your irrigation controller before summer watering begins is extremely important. So before you set your clock and walk away, here are a few things to look for. One, broken pipes. Two, gopher damage. Three, damaged sprinklers and four missing or broken drip emitters. Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change and together we can save water and share healthy organic fruit with our neighbors. There are tons of resources online that can help. Visit waterwisesb.org for more info or you can view the past episodes of the show. You can also call us with any questions at 564-5311. I'm your host, Meg West, and keep it green, Santa Barbara.